in any case, all right. So uh, what I want to do uh, in this presentation is to think about genius um, and what could be considered, uh, especially during the Renaissance period, uh, its necessary condition, which is to say melancholy. And um, of course, uh, for any you know, serious work on genius and melancholy, one would have to return to an immense archive of literature that includes uh, pseudo Aristotle's uh, Problemata, uh, Richard Burton's Monumental Anatomy of Melancholy, Freud's uh, Morning and Melancholia, and then Butler's, you know, Judith Butler's response, Freud and the Melancholia Agenda, uh, John Stachowinski, Long de la Melancholie. Uh, Julia Kristeva's uh, Soleil Noir, uh, Lorinda Dixon's Dark Side of Genius, Mitchell's, uh, Mitchell Murbeck's Perfections Therapy, Mark Fisher's Ghost of My Life, etc. etc. Um, evidently, I will not be able to do this here. So, uh, what follows can only at best be a very brief outline of the traces of genius and melancholy in John Nancy. Now, uh, in the eyes of many of us, many of us here, there is no doubt about Nancy's genius. We recognize not only his genius of thought, but also his ingenuity in articulating his thoughts in a mode of writing that is not just lucid, but also oftentimes lyrical or even poetic. Melancholy, meanwhile, is not a trait with which we really associate Nancy. Melancholic is arguably not how we would describe Nancy as a person and his thoughts or writings. After all, in events or thoughts that typically send one into a depressive or melancholic spiral, Nancy is able to enthusiastically see an opening of hope or optimism, the chance of something new or unthought of yet. Thus, while some of us might be devastatingly heartbroken by a breakup, Nancy would argue that the latter is not a teary affair. Rather, it leaves the heart open, uh, like what Okia has already told us, it leaves the heart open to receive others, including those whom we previously thought would never love, or by whom we would never be loved. Or on a more planetary scale, such as our current pandemic, which has brought along with it the frequent, the frequent lockdowns and the long-standing social and travel restrictions, it is not all doom and gloom for Nongsi. Instead, according to him, in Anto Human Vihus, it offers us the chance to experience experience in its very essence. That is to say, in its absolute surprise, unknowability, and uncertainty through which one finds no way through or out, or of which one is without mastery. The chance to redefine what it means to live well without eliding death, sickness, the accidental, and the unforeseeable that are in fact intrinsic aspects of, ex of, of existing. The chance to exist without posing the viral and agitating question, why? But to live with the fact that things happen more so without reason, sans raison, than because of a calculated or calculable rationale, de raison. And that things come to presence like a flower blooming, a burst of laughter, or a song. By extension, it is no surprise that, that death, which tends to cast its long shadow before the melancholic, barely phases non see. And dialogue under the ribs, which reflects on his heart transplant 20 years after through a staged dialogue with his heart. We read that Nong Si, in fact, didn't really care if he would have a new heart or not when his old heart was stopping. This nonchalance is quite a contrast to the, appreh to the apprehension of dying, the refusal to learn how to die, which one finds in Derrida in his final interview. And with all these supplementary complications and other pains that came with living with a new heart, where life makes life difficult for itself, to quote Nong Si, there would, no, there would be no giving up on life on Nong Si's part. No thoughts, at least apparently, of dying in order to put an end to all the sufferings. 
this indifference toward dying and non see also translates into a form of stoic reticence when it comes to the death of others. For example, writing on the occasion of Dachida's death, we find no effusive sadness or regret in Nongsi. Instead, Nongsi would insist that the time of mourning, even though sleek homages might be inevitable, is not the time for analysis or discussion. This is perhaps why Nancy has no brooding and melancholic uh, work of morning book like Derrida does for his philosopher friends who have passed. To a certain extent, Nancy has acknowledged this absence of melancholy in his thoughts and writings. Unless it is melancholy in terms of the sentiment of living or writing after the fact which is to say the sentiment of a passing sentiment of which he claims not to be insensitive. As Nongsi understands this melancholy, it is, and I quote Nongsi, the sentiment of not being there, of not being present to my own activity of being in the world, hence of thinking and writing, which is to say of trying to give form precisely to this being in the world. He continues. In me, this sentiment is whereby it is not me who is there in this activity, passivity, but another and other, others, the entire mass of a dead in the French sa, where my culture, my history, my language only leave to the eye in lowercase the quasi non-dimensional place of a point that effectively writes, traces an exploration without subject or object only occupied to allow, if it can, the trace of a sensibility to take shape by itself." End quote. In a way, such a sentiment is a subjectless affect, a structure of feeling, as Raymond Williams would say, that transpires between the personal and the environment around him or her, finding its nascent formation in the language and literature of one's time before, de before developing into some form of historical consciousness. Otherwise, the melancholy that affects non C is not something that draws him toward an interiority of the self, a closure of the self, the solitary, abyssal sinking of the self into the rabbit hole of depression, anguish, and hopelessness. On the contrary, it is, once again, an opening toward the outside of the self, by which one's culture, history, and language can be inflected within so as to allow the body without agency to bear the inscription of the particular sensibility of a particular time. The labyrinth, Nancy's term, that lies beneath or behind the sentiment of melancholy is not so dark, therefore, or not without exit. According to Nancy, he is able to shed some light on this labyrinth to alleviate this labyrinthine condition to writing, teaching, action. He recognizes that some melancholics do all those too. But at the same time, he also acknowledges that it has always been difficult for him to share his brand of not so negative or hopeful melancholy, as much as he has not been able to share in the dark and hopeless version. Here, it seems that sharing, baktash, an important motive for Nongsi touches on one of its limits. While existence and freedom, according to Nongsi, can be or are shared among all existence, melancholy seems unshareable to a certain extent. It adds to the mystery of the singularity of each existent, which Nongsi has argued to inhere common in all existence, but never common to all since each mystery is unknown to another. Unshareable melancholy is what leads Nongsi to say, and I quote, I am thus reduced to be a little melancholic by not knowing melancholy, end quote. This is regrettable for Nongsi too, since he is aware that melancholy, according to a long tradition, at least in the West, is the mark of genius. In other words, with little melancholy, he suspects that he is not a genius. Yet, 
As said earlier, many of us recognize the genius in Nongxi. What kind of genius is Nongxi then? If he is not what Susan Sontag calls under the sign of Saturn. To answer this question, perhaps one could turn to a text where genius is at stake. L'Absolute Littéraire, written with Philippe Lacoulabat. In this text, one enters into a discussion of genius under the ages of the German Romantics, the Jena Romantics, which include the Schlegel brothers, Schelling, John Paul, Novalis, etc., etc. According to how Nancy and Lacoulabat read these thinkers, the Romantic geniuses are those who, while inhabiting a disorderly or apparently senseless or else chaotic world, are able to articulate or give expression to a sensibility that is nascent in this very same world. And they are able to do so only because they have vids around them. Nancy and Lacoulabat recognize that this German word vids is hardly translatable. However, noting how the word is nevertheless related to visa or knowledge and to the English wit, they propose understanding it as another concept of knowledge or a concept of another knowledge, savoir autre. In any case, this vids disavows any debilitating disposition as Friedrich Schlegel says in the critical fragment, nothing is more disdainful than a sad fit. The promise of fit is its generative potentiality. And this is how romantic geniuses are able to transcend the anguishing chaos of the world and see it as the site of possible generations, the false presence of production. This is where work needs to be done on the part of the geniuses and I quote, not to dissipate or reabsorb this chaos, but to construct it or to make a work of its disorganization, end quote. They have to harness, if not cultivate, this otherwise explosive and dangerous if left to its errancy into writing. Here arises the figure of the artist in the Romantic Genius, where, and I quote in him, in him poetry and philosophy are reconciled or, or, or merge, fusioning, end quote. And the genre adequate to such an art in the eyes of the German romantics is none other than the fragment. For them, the fragment is, and I quote, not to be confused with a pure and simple detached piece, the residue of a broken on song or even an erratic block, end quote. In other words, the fragment is not a mark of a broken nostalgia for a past that is supposedly whole or complete, a hopeless melancholic reflection on the inevitable ends of finitude. Instead, it tears open a way out of this nostalgia and melancholy, suggesting that there is always something other to come, and it should not matter if this other is more or less. This is to say that while the fragment affirms finitude, no doubt, it also reaffirms or reiterates the infiniteness and finite of finitude. And with this notion of infinity, I, I, I believe I'm anticipating uh, Frederick Neha's uh, paper on infinia. So we will see. Thus, and I quote again, what it designates, what the fragment designates as much the edges or the fracture, it is also an autonomous form that is as much the formlessness or unformedness, unformity, or deformity of the tearing. End quote. It is in this regard that the expose that is each fragment does not lay claim to any exhaustivity, or that it encompasses an essential incompleteness. To be sure, this does not at all imply a linear homogeneous development, such as the infinite progressivity of romantic poetry or perhaps the Hegelian bad infinite. But the marking of, again to quote, infiniteness in the act through the very fragmentary device. Put another way, the fragment is the recognition of a singularity amid a plurality of other singularities or fragments. Each fragment in itself only affirms the incompleteness of its infiniteness, 
casting its glance towards something outside of itself, other than itself. In Nancy and La Coulabat's words, this is how the fragment and the quote again figures the auxiliary work, the hors d'oeuvre, essential to the work, more essential to the work than the work itself. Hence, more than putting into play the dispersion or bursting of the work inscribes its plurality as the excerpt of the total infinite work. End quote. One could no doubt borrow Blanchot's terms here, term here, a term that Nancy will pick up to and say, the fragment is the deservement of all earth, the unworking of all works, only to reinstall in any works its opening toward an infiniteness. To return to the rhetoric of l'absolute de terre, it is dissolution and energy at the same time, where energy points to an infinite plasticity or the putting to work itself, la mise en oeuvre elle-même, if not the completed organa of which all the works of genius are only forces, puissance again. In all, the fragment is what the romantic genius must inscribe through vids. And in so doing, the genius becomes coextensive with vids, assuming, and I quote, a relative formlessness or unformness, unformity, if not deformity, as force of formation. He implies the gap, a car, between the view and the work, the infinite gap that the genius overcomes, but only through a blind and formless leap. End quote. Now, I believe that I do not need to rehearse the many writings of Nancy to underscore the ideas of the singular plural, of the community that resists any work or project only to allow itself to take on other forms of the opening toward, toward an infinite finitude of existence and freedom, of a force, optimistic or otherwise, that drives thinking and writing and all which no one can control in order to demonstrate their correspondences to the ideas that subtend the discussion of romantic genius in absolute de terre. This is also not to mention again, the style of Nancy's philosophical prose, which as said, is arguably lyrical and poetic at the same time, or his sympathy for fragments that can be elicited from the prototype versions of sexistons and Kefer. In short, then we could speak of the romantic genius of Nancy. And here I, I, I'm, I'm making a nod to Okia's uh, work on, on Nancy as a romantic uh, philosopher. Um, and also, you know, all that talk I'm um, mentioning about fragments, I, I, I suggest we can uh, return to Ian e. James' wonderful book on Nancy and the fragmentary demand, uh, back to his introduction, which I really like. But perhaps Nancy's melancholy genius without melancholy can be put in more recent terms. As a, quick, as a quick conclusion, I would like to suggest thinking a reparative genius, Nancy. And I would even argue that this might be necessary given a queer feminist trajectory born by the term reparative, according to Melanie Klein and then Eve Satch Week. In order to break with the masculinity or gender divide that the German romantics have imputed to the idea of genius. Friedrich Schlager has suggested that love is to females as genius is to males. Let me quickly cite Satch Week on the reparatively positioned reader. This is Satch Week. To a reparatively positioned reader, it can seem realistic and necessary to experience surprise. Because there can be terrible surprises, however, there can also be good ones. Hope, often a fracturing, even a traumatic thing to experience, is among the energies by which the reparatively positioned reader tries to organize the fragments and part objects she encounters or creates because the reader has room to realize that the future may be different from the present. It is also possible for her to entertain such profoundly painful, profoundly relieving, ethically crucial possibilities that a past in turn could have happened differently from the way it actually did, end quote. In other words, with the reparative, which has a taste no less for the fragment and which possesses as well an energy that bears the potentiality for plasticity, the idea of genius does not need to be dark, solitary, or pessimistic. Under the sign of Saturn, 
as students of vaccines. A reparative genius can shine forth with hope, optimism, and love. Go back to Alkyus' work, all of which, no doubt, inflects Nancy's writings. I shall end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irving. Um, I'll open this up to questions. Does anybody want to start? Thanks. For, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, George. Uh, I can also wait if there's more hands, please. I just want to open the discussion. Yes. So, Irving, so thank you so much. Uh, this, this sets up something fantastic. Uh, I think there is definitely a dichotomy in the history of philosophy. Um, um, traditionally, uh, Heraclitus is the weeping philosopher, Democritus is the laughing philosopher. This is a caricature, of course, but with that comes an interesting filiation, uh, whereby Spinoza, for example, is a thinker of joy, and you have Nietzsche, which is a complicated case, but really an affirmation of joy in so many ways. And then you have, uh, you know, other, other materialist philosophers like Deleuze, who's often been read as a philosopher of joy. And, 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 um, and it's interesting because that doesn't necessarily, but do you, do you see a correspondence in kind of ontology and epistemology with this kind of affective dimension? Or do you think that th there is no necessary connection? Mm, well, that's, that's a very interesting question and very difficult to answer, but I do think that some kind of uh, uh, affective connection and uh, sometimes that connection can be, you know, denied by the philosophers themselves. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad you mentioned uh, like Deleuze, I mean, who is, who like Nancy is, whose philosophy is very life affirming, right? I mean, for Deleuze, he, he would say that, you know, wherever life is being threatened, one has to, there must be combat. It's, it's so life affirming and, and that's, that's philosophy, right? Uh, that's theory. And yet in life itself where, you know, affects become real and, and become material and become bodily and, and something that you cannot deny. Um, you, I mean, um, it's, it's an understandable case, but you see Deleuze basically giving up on life. I mean, where the pain is too much um, and well, you know, think, talking about pain, I mean, Werner Hamacher has a very nice uh, uh, piece to one of his last pieces that is called Other Pains. And he would say that, you know, um, uh, he would argue that even through writing, even through philosophy, there's some kind of crying out as well. And so if you want to think about ontology or things like that, you know, the, the ontology uh, might, might perhaps try to conceal certain affects, but that affect that is, for example, pain, we still, we still see it true, as, as Bernard Hamaker would have argued. It's true language itself. There's always this cry in language. So, yeah, I'm not too sure whether I, I, I you know, answered your, your question properly. I think, yeah, I think you did. Thank you. And it's an open question. I, just to initiate some more thoughts. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, to all yours. Yes. Yeah, uh, this is just a small question. Uh, I was wondering how you relate uh, uh, the sentence of Nancy, les gens sont bizarres, uh, people are strange, mm -hmm. uh, which somehow uh, uh, describes the common strangeness of everybody. Everybody is a bit strange, but mm -hmm. nobody is above the others. Yes. Whereas the, the romantic notion of, uh, of the genius has always seemed to me to be above, uh, apart in the sense of uh, aboveness. So uh, I was wondering if uh, Nancy's genius doesn't have this uh, very particular uh, everyday ordinary character to it that's uh, separating it from the romantics. Yes, absolutely. I, I, th I think that's great. I, uh, I, I do agree with you that the German romantics have, they do have this idea where, you know, the, the, the geniuses like stand above the rest. But interestingly, I think in, in Nancy's and La Coulabat's reading of the German rom romantics, they actually bring that down. They, they seem to give it some kind of Republican kind of um, uh, 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 perspective to the genius. So uh, there will be one part of uh, um, of of um, 
uh, Lapsu Lili Dakha, where they would say that, you know, we are not talking about the artists of artists. Not, we are not talking about the genius of geniuses, but it's always talking about a, a society of, of, or, or a community better, of, of artists. So it's always artists like genius among other, uh, other artists, other, other geniuses. None, none is going to stand above another. And, and, and they would say that, you know, uh, what, what they do is to share something that they sense of their time and, and uh, to share in the origin of that, that, of that sensibility. So I, 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 I believe that this is, you know, <laughs> um, uh, Nongsi's and Lakulabad's reading of, of, of the German, German romantics, not the German romantics per se, you know. Yeah, good, good point. I uh, absolutely agree. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, you're, you're on mute again. <laughs> Yeah, no, thanks very much. It, it somehow made sense. And my question before wasn't a provocation. I had no noticed that you were going to speak about melancholy. But yeah. maybe it was because I was listening to the previous intervention so much under the influence of Derrida, who is the one I write about and love. Um, and I was thinking, especially to the book, that Derrida devotes to Sixu on the question of uh, the genius, the genealogy, and you know, and uh -huh. at the one point he tries to define the question of genius as what allows what comes to come somehow. Uh -huh. No, uh, and I was wondering, have you thought why Nancy has not produced a somehow systematic? Uh, idea of writing that seems mm. so relevant, uh, even to Lacula Bart when they were working on the, the, the question of romantic poetry. How mm -hmm. comes the he goes to community, he goes to so many other elements, yeah. but yeah. not to a kind of meta reflection on writing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think. Strangely enough, it's because when I when I go back to uh, L'Absolu de Terre, that it began to make sense to me, you know, whatever that you were suggesting, you know, that this whole multiplicity of, of um, thoughts, motifs, and as if there is no system. But uh, it's what Nancy and Lacoub Labat said about the fragment too. It's, it's a system, but without systematicity. It has a, it's, it is always suggesting something else, something, something larger. And so it's always opening itself. There's, there's, it, it's never finished, and and they would like to re, they would like to keep it as that, like a fragment, and and so um, and 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 even though you know like what you said, you know there's so many topics that 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 uh, Nancy has written about, but you 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 see a certain link that you know there's always some kind of like motif or motif that 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 traverses each uh, different topic in that sense. So. Interestingly, I, I'm beginning to 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 see the value of this, uh, you know, the L'Absolu de la book, and to to try to understand, you know, through, especially the, through the fragment, through bits, and all that kind of things, to 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 look back. Interestingly, I'm going back to his early work and then to to look back again. So, yeah. thank, thank you. Yes. Uh, Artemy, uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, I have a. <clears throat> very simplistic um, comment mm -hmm. that uh, actually uh, Jean-Luc's um, attitude to melancholia is most obvious from the fact that he actually chose uh, La Coulabar as his friend. <laughs> when he did so, you know, he, com he fulfilled his uh, uh, duty towards melancholia and didn't bother about it anymore. Uh, okay. Maybe changed after Philippe's death. But uh, mm -hmm. obviously there was a division of roles and again, Jean-Luc didn't have to bother, but you are right that of course, melancholia is crucial to philosophy as such. It's an important condition, particularly such as deconstruction, which is based on some kind of transcendental negativity, which Jean-Luc seems to have shared with Philippe, uh, this principle. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, do you have a question? Yes, um, 
I would like to know if you uh, would um, consider place um, in, in respect to genius. I, I remember um, Leit Stiegler was, uh, was talking about uh, the, the, his kind of uh, genius as the, the one who is relating to a place and what has to be done at a certain point in time. So I don't know if you would connect that to the way Nancy would go about it. Wow, okay, I, I, I'm not familiar with Stiegler's uh, fr exact phrase there. I don't know, I mean, I, I know two people here who work on Stiegler a lot. I mean, that's Ian and that's Martin. So I'm not too sure I mean, if, if Martin and Ian would like to chime in here and help me out. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not a genius. That's why it's like I need help. So it's like no, no, no answer here. <laughs> it doesn't matter. In fact, I just wanted to um, to um, ask if you would have to say something about the way Nancy uh, uh, responded to actuality and to the place and time in which he was, and that mm. is a kind of. Well, I mean, interesting. I mean, I mean well, uh, you you mentioned place, but you know, there's something that uh, that kind of like came up when I was doing this paper, and 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 instead of place, I mean, Nancy has talked about place. I mean, uh, lieu and 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 it's links to like politics or the, the possibility of politics, but I've in, in recent times. So um, in in let's say in in his book on 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 a virus, he's talking about he he's touching more on the idea of a point rather than a place. And, and it, it fascinates me. And, and, and I'm just wondering, you know, what this point is. I mean, so um, for, for Nancy, everything has a point. And, and, but he would say that this point is non-dimensional. And this comes up again in, in, in the L'Absolu Literaire book, a kind of, um, if I'm not wrong, or maybe I'm wrong. Um, hang on. Yes. So, um, but, but this idea of a point, non-dimensional, it's, to, to, me, to me, it's fascinating. And, and it, it seems to, to me to challenge the idea of a place, lieu or espace. And, um, and this, this goes back to a kind of a more complicated uh, idea in Long Si, where the idea of space and time is not so distinct. And, and, and as you know, the, 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 the kind of like the traverse of time itself creates space and vice versa as well. So, uh, I'm sorry, Paul. I mean, I don't have a, I, 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 don't, I don't, I don't really have a, 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 a proper answer to your question on place. But I would, I would, I would say that I, I think in more recent times, I think the idea of point seems to be, seems to, 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 to punctuate. I would say, you know, Nancy's more recent point. Yeah. Um, 